Brenda, request back here for Because He Lives. Give me a verse in the course of that. Would you stand, please? Good evening, everybody. Good evening, those watching. Thank God for everybody. Thank you. You all look good tonight, too. All right, let's sing Because He Lives. God sent His Son. Dog, this is a fresh request. It's not in any of the books, but I'll feed you the words if I have to. God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to to heal and That's it. To work my part and empty too. The tomb is there to see my Savior Because he lives. Amen. Turn to number 293. I want to sing this song. There's a fountain open. I love this old song because it's absolutely true. Number 293. That's I like that about it too. Here we go. There's a fountain opened in the house of God where the vilest of sinners may go. And go test the power of the crimson flood of the blood that makes whiter than snow. Praise the Lord. I am washed in the all cleansing blood of the Lamb. And my robes are whiter than the driven snow. I am washed in the blood of the Lamb. When that fount was opened in the Savior's sight, how the thief did rejoice in his name. And when dying, Lord, remember me, he cried, Oh, the blood washed his sin all away. Praise the Lord, I am washed in the all-cleansing blood of the Lamb. And my robes are whiter than the dreaming snow. I am washed in the blood, just keep singing. When reason is the Lord with me, though your sins bred like crimson do glow. And if dyed with scarlet stain your heart may be, I will make it as white as the snow. Praise the Lord, I am washed in the all-cleansing blood of the Lamb. And my robes are whiter than the dreaming snow. I am washed in the blood of the Lamb. I have overcome now by the blood of the Lamb, and I'm clothed in my raiment so white, and I'm on my journey to that glorious land, where forever I'll dwell in the light. Praise the Lord, I am washed in the all-cleansing blood of the Lamb, and my robe are whiter than the driven snow. 
I am washed in the blood. Listen. For these in spotless robes and his name they, as they're singing with palms in their hands. These through tribulation bring the victory, having washed in the blood of the Lamb. Praise the Lord, I am washed in the all-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. Amen. Would you remain standing, please, as we go to prayer? I love the theology that is written into our songs. Yes, Praise the Lord, I am washed in the all cleansing blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. It is possible. It is possible in Jesus Christ to have dominion, dominance over sin. Amen. That's the wonderful good news of the gospel. The all-cleansing blood, that fountain that was opened in the side of the Lamb. Out come the blood and the water. What a combination to clean us up. Praise the Lord. It's good to see each and every one of you tonight. God bless you. Uh, I'm going to bring you up to date on what's going on the rest of the week. Brother Nathan is going to be preaching this evening. This will be his last sermon, and we're going to take a love offering up for him in a little while. And then he is going to be with us again tomorrow evening. He wants to visit with uh, Brother Charlie Heater that's coming in tomorrow and a good friend of his, and he's looking forward to hearing him preach. And Charlie is going to preach on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We're going to break on Saturday so everybody can catch their breath. And then Charlie will close the service out on Sunday morning, next Sunday. Okay, so you got it? You got it? No gifts. Um, well, we don't bet, but if I was a betting man, I'd say about two or three of you are going to show up on Saturday. All right, but anyway, let's uh, look to the Lord. We've had a wonderful week. We've heard enough preaching to save the world. God has been good. He's favored us. We're highly favored of the Lord. And let's continue to birth the blessings of God. Let's continue to labor and make the sacrifice. And if you want a blessing bad enough, I'll tell you, God really wants to bless every one of us richly. So let's just continue to be looking to the Lord to open up the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing. We um, want to continue to remember Ron Campbell in prayer. He's doing better. Want to pray for Vicki Lewis and Vicki Wolf. Jeff Moran is doing much better. Brother Crouch is coming along. Has anybody heard how he's doing today, by the way? Um, let's continue to pray for him. He said he had a bad case of the flu a few days ago. I suspect he's getting a little better. We want to remember Jay, his son, in prayer. Larry Green, we want to continue to pray for him. And then we want to remember Brother Linder's wife in prayer. She's still having trouble with her back. And then Sister Martha... Now there's uh, Brother Haas's mother. She had two surgeries, and neither one has completed the job. And now at her age, she's got to have a third surgery to, to fix the first two. So, and she so was desirous to be here uh, for, for Easter and for uh, Palm Sunday and for the revival. And the situation with her is she just has to 
wait now until this third surgery uh, is scheduled. So let's remember her in prayer. Uh, Brother Gayhart, I'm going to ask you to lift your voice and lead us in prayer. If you want to come up here, fine. If you want to pray from there, that's fine. Whichever you want to do. Yes, testing one. Oh, yeah, the Kohlers. We want to remember the Kohlers in prayer. Testing one, two. Testing one, two. You don't have to come up for the game. I'll come up this way. This is my favorite route. <laughs> uh, did you lose me here? Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you for reminding Sister Sarah Ingram, most of you know she's been ill. She's had a bad infection and a bad foot. And uh, with her sugar, it's really complicated. And she has to continually have it redressed. And then she's got another condition going on that's serious. So we really want to get a hold of the Lord for all these people that are struggling. And this is just a small list of the many that are really going through some difficulty. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, I'll take your burdens by an upraised hand. If you bow your heads, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, you said in your word, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord would deliver them from them all. Amen. God, we found that to be true, but we found the other part of that sentence to be true also, that you are delivering your people. You are the great deliverer. You're the great I am. We thank you for being with us this week, Lord, and how people have come out when they naturally would have stayed at home, but they came out to hear the word of God and thank the Lord we haven't been disappointed. Thank you for the truth that's gone forth from this pulpit, and God, we are trusting and know we'll go forth tonight. We just pray you'd be with Brother Nathan. You'd give him the words that you'd have him say. You'd known him from on high, and Lord, let the service be fruitful, and at the end, may we see souls at the altar seeking you, Heavenly Father, for salvation. Lord, you hear this long list of people that are afflicted. We can't remember them all, but Lord, you know each and every one. So Lord, we just ask you to open up the storehouse of heaven tonight, Lord, and you would supply these needs according to your riches in glory. Lord, be with the young people's choir tonight, Heavenly Father. Bless them. Help them to sing, Lord, like the angels up in glory, Lord. And be Brother Cody as he directs the youth choir. And then be with the after service. May everything that's said and done be to your glory and up to the advancement of the kingdom of God. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. sat by the river and wept to remembering the good old days when they lift up their voices to heaven and sing a song of wonderful praise now the enemy had them in bondage and their harps on the willows were hung he said, how can we sing in a strange land a song of joy when there's none? But I do got a song.
each day. The enemy tries to enslave me and steal my song away. But if I just keep trusting in Jesus and in his will I remain the joy and strength he gives to my weary soul will be enough to sustain but I've still got a song though the enemy rages I've still got a song though battered and torn deep in my heart there's joy that stays my trials can't take my song away the battles may long my faith is made strong and I've still got a song I've still got a song Crossing the calm sea with Jesus The disciples were getting concerned The wind started violently blowing But he was asleep in the stern Does he not care that we perish? We're helpless and we're so afraid Jesus arose when they called him And said to them, where is your faith? hit you without any warning the storm of your life had begun and seeing no hope in the distance you're frightened and nowhere to run by now your vessel is filling and you're thinking that you'll surely drown you cried out for help from the Savior And you know you can't give up now
you're out there worried. He's fast asleep. The winds are so deadly. The water's so deep. But try to be patient. Because you prayed all night, but you fell on with all of your might. Drop your cries, I've woken the master. Oh, he knows your voice, lift your hands. While we take our evening offering, our special offering, uh, turn to page number 200, uh, 280 at Calvary, love it. 280. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's grace at word, then I trembled at the I spurred till my guilty soul implored to Calvary. See, there was great and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Sing the last verse, please. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man oh the mighty gold that God did spend at Calvary mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burdened soul found liberty Amen. Brother Carl Lohr has a song. God bless. Get up here and not say something 
when you have the gift of gab. Now my wife says, let's go, he'll just keep talking. But I want to thank our sponsor tonight, Rob Romine, gave me this haircut. You can get them at Backstreet Haircutters downtown Newark. The suspenders have been inside the shirt because I always wear shirts you can't tuck in. But last night, if you'll remember, I was officially designated an old face. So now I feel free to wear them on the outside, especially since I lost weight from the COVID and can tuck my shirts in again. This is a serious song. I wish I was a serious person. <clears throat> but I am serious about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who I love with all my heart. Oh, how well do I remember how I doubted day by day, for I did not know for certain that my sins were washed away. When the Spirit tried to tell me I would not the truth receive, I endeavored to be happy and to make myself believe. But it's real, it's real, oh, I know it's real. Praise God, the doubts are settled. And I know, I know it's real. When the truth came close and searching, all my joy would disappear. For I did not have the witness of the Spirit bright and clear. If at times the coming judgment would appear before my mind, Oh, it made me so uneasy, for God's smile I could not find. But it's real, it's real, oh, I know it's real. Praise God, the doubts are settled, for I know, I know it's real. When the Lord sent faithful servants who would dare to preach the truth, how my heart did so condemn me as the Spirit gave reproof. Satan said at once twill ruin you to now confess your state. Keep on working and professing and you'll enter heaven's gate. Not that way. But it's real, it's real, oh, I know it's real. Praise God, the doubts are settled, for I know, I know it's real. But at last I tired of living such a life of fear and doubt. For I wanted God to give me something I would know about. So the truth would make me happy, and the light would clearly shine, and the Spirit give assurance that I'm His, and He is mine. But it's real, it's real, oh, I know. It's real. Praise God, the doubts are settled, for I know, I know it's real. So I prayed to God in earnest, and not caring what folks said, I was hungry for the blessing, my poor soul, it must be fed. Then at last by faith I touched him, and like sparks from smitten steel, just so quick salvation reached me. Oh, bless God, I know it's real. But it's real, it's real. Oh, I know it's real. Praise God, the doubts are settled, 
For I know, I know it's real. And Dilly has a song. Got to make sure the mics are on before I start singing.
have a youth trio before the message this evening. I guess it is evening. up this morning your presence filled the room with a grateful heart I just shook my head as I bowed in awe of you Lord you have been so faithful so loving kind and true and every morning your mercies are new you have been good been good more than I could ever dream you would you have been good you have been good immeasurably more than you should you have been good have been good more than I could ever dream you would you have been good you have been good immeasurably more than you should you have been good no matter holds or what tomorrow brings you are sovereign god of the universe you are lord of everything you are still good you are still good more than i could ever dream good immeasurably more than you should you have been good yesterday I was hunting for $150 in an account that had seven plus million dollars that went through it and I was sitting at my desk and I'd looked all morning and I just bowed my head and said Lord if you could help me find that today I would really appreciate it and within 15 minutes I found it he just cares about the little things he is so good amen on our worst day God is still good Every one, one Sunday a month, our kids take over an entire service, and they do everything, the offering, the singing, preaching, and uh, we just love the way that God is using our kids, and they're going to be a strong church tomorrow because they're being well-trained today. And they're not ashamed, they're not mic shy, they're just glad to be doing something for Jesus. And Cody has done a wonderful job, and Brenda working with all the parts. This was only half of them, the other half are, who knows 
but they're around, and uh, we really appreciate our kids. Uh, Sister Anita, that was uh, Sandy Kohler's brother, right? That is, or, or her son Ray that is very sick, and we want to remember. He's in the hospital. Okay, we want to remember. And they were in the service a couple weeks back, so we want to remember uh, Ray in prayer. And also, we don't want to overlook uh, Haas's brother-in-law, Greg McDonald. He has this brain condition that's very serious, and they're trying to treat him and uh, see what they can do. And I know that's a lot of stress on Nancy, his wife, and the family. So we want to hold up Greg McDonald and also Ray Kohler in prayer and just pray that uh, God will will be there with the assurance and the grace and the strength that they need in a time like this. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, and uh, he's done a great job. We appreciate his willingness to come, be away from his congregation for a few days, to come up here and help us, and we appreciate his ministry, his gift, and his love that he has for the kingdom of God. So let's receive uh, Brother Lazier with another good amen. Again, it's a delight to be here and... Uh, this uh, is always a place of honor to speak at. It's also a place of intimidation to speak at. I am scheduled to speak in a few weeks at Pastors Fellowship again, and you speak to a couple hundred pastors. And I have to tell you that it's not as intimidating there as it is here. And it doesn't have anything to do with your attitude, but it does have to do with your experiences in the church. Uh, if I were to sit my hair on fire and do the moonwalk, I think that would about be about the only way that I could say something or do something you haven't heard or seen done. And you might have even seen the moonwalk in here before. Uh, but you have had great pastors, Pastor Bartlett, and then many of you are pastored by Brother Wilson. And you have a great legacy. And again, those are uh, intimidating shoes to try to stand in in this place and fill, and it's impossible to do, but we'll do our best. This is my last night uh, speaking. I'll be here tomorrow night. I'm going to stay over and hear Charlie Heater preach. Charlie is a great pastor, great preacher. If you haven't heard Charlie, I think you ought to come back and hear him. He used to pastor the church that I am currently pastoring, and we live about four miles apart, and he is a great, wise man, a powerful preacher, Great voice in the pulpit, and uh, he's worth your time to hear. I want to stake out a position, and then I want to spend the rest of my time trying to reinforce uh, this position and tell you what I think we ought to do about it. I believe that in the coming weeks and months and years that the church and that believers are going to have to rediscover courage in our lives. I think that... In general, courage is lacking in our public lives and in our private lives. And if we don't rediscover courage, if we don't find our strength, if we don't, don't find an initiative quick, it may be too late, at least in our public life. And sometimes it grows really late in our private life. Uh, I look at the way the culture has changed in the last 20 or 30 years. And I think it's probably safe to say that there is a culture war of, of sorts. I think that that is a, a pretty self-evident thing. I think that there is a war against biblical Christianity that is being waged in this country. And I think it's a war that those who espouse biblical Christianity would have to say that, in general, we are losing, and we are losing badly. And I think there are a couple of reasons why the tide has turned against us, and I think in the next few years, if, again, we can't rediscover 
uh, some significant things into the life of the church, we are going to about completely lose the war for biblical Christianity in America. I think one of the reasons is because the opposition has seen the key issues far more clearly than we have in our culture. Uh, back a generation ago, those who wanted to transform America into a vision that, in my opinion, is not a God-honoring vision, understood that to transform America, they understood that to win a culture war, they had to take two great mountains, and if they took those mountains, they would be very hard to beat. They had to dominate education. They had to dominate the media. And 40 years ago, when we were arguing about whether you should go to school, or we're arguing certainly about whether a preacher ought to be educated in a college, they looked beyond that and said, no, we are going to dominate the colleges. And once we dominate education, we are going to be difficult to deal with. Forty years ago, when conservative Christians were arguing about whether we should own TVs, the opposition said, no, we need to be the ones deciding what's on TVs. And when we take over the content of the media in this nation and we take over education, we are going to be almost impossible to defeat because those are the two critical issues in a culture war. I think the opposition saw the future in ways that those who defended biblical Christianity did not have the vision to see. But I think secondly, not only did they see the key issues of the fight more clearly, but in general they had far more courage than those who, at least in their hearts, believed the Bible to be true. You know, when I think of my life growing up in secular America, uh, understand what I'm saying here. I think that uh, the LGBTQ community uh, is wrong in what they believe. I believe that those lifestyles are sinful and contrary to the Word of God. But when I think of those folks in high school who identified as gay or lesbian, I have to admit to you tonight, I have great admiration for their courage. Because they were going around and the locker rooms were tough. They were getting pummeled. They were getting crucified. And the kids raised in the church were going to high school and they were scared to death somebody would call them a virgin. Uh, the opposition to biblical Christianity had far more courage. They would take a stand they would get pummeled, they would get crucified, they would get ostracized, they would be made fun of, but those who claim to espouse biblical Christianity, you couldn't get them to stand up and say anything in the defense of God. And in general, the side that sees the issues more clearly and the side that is far more courageous is going to win 99 out of 100 fights. And so we have a situation here again where it is important, vital, that the church rediscover what it means, first of all, to be courageous in the public sphere, but also to be courageous in our private lives. And to drive that home in your thinking tonight, I want to turn to Esther chapter 4. In the book of Esther, you have a young woman who needs to rediscover what it means to be courageous, and she didn't have an awful lot of time to do it. Uh, her people are being plotted against. And in Esther chapter 4, verse 1, Mordecai, who is the man who raised her, who I believe was her uncle, or perhaps a cousin, uh, has learned that there is a vast conspiracy to destroy the Jewish people. Now, more on that in a minute. And so, in verse 4, Esther has been married to the king by this point. The king is a 
man of his times. Uh, he has 400 wives. Um, she's married to the king. She lives somewhere in the vast uh, palace complex. And perhaps she does not know that this conspiracy exists in her land. Uh, perhaps she's in a place where she is not getting the newspaper of the day. And in verse 1, the Bible says in Esther chapter 4, that when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried with a loud and a bitter cry. Now, someone who knows Esther knows that Mordecai is her relative, that he's the man who raised her. And so word comes to Esther, who lives again in the palace complex, that Mordecai is grieved, he's tearing his clothes, he's concerned about a situation, he seems to be distraught over some news that he has received. And so the Bible says in the, pre in the verses that follow that Esther sends him a new suit of clothes. Got to love her. Like, well, if I tore my dress, I'd be crying too. I would hope somebody would send me a new dress. He's tore his clothes, send him some more clothes. And I think Mordecai, when he receives the clothes, discovers she doesn't understand that somebody's trying to kill all the Jews. So he sends back a message to her in verse 10. He says to her, uh, uh, through Hathak, uh, this command, he says, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know, pardon me, he sends word, let me go back. Uh, she is told what has happened. And Mordecai says, you've got to go to the king. Now in verse 10, Esther sends back a message to Mordecai saying this, Mordecai, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law. Put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai as Esther's words. And Mordecai told them, uh, told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews and from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are present in uh, Susham and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded. First point. If you and I are going to rediscover what courage means, you and I are going to first of all need to be clear that there are some fights that we cannot run from. Uh, Esther is not a courageous person, but Mordecai looks at her and, and or, or says to her, uh, when Esther says, listen, I can't go into him. Uh, I, you don't understand. If I go in, he doesn't extend the scepter to me. I'll die. I can't do that. And, and, and uh, Mordecai, I think, hears something in her words, which is this. Esther believes 
that somehow, because she's in the palace, she can duck, she can escape. Other Jews may get killed, but somehow she'll survive. And so I think Mordecai has sort of this, this, uh, um, this response, oh no, you didn't say that. Don't tell me that you think that somehow you can get out of this while everybody else who's Jewish dies. Don't think that you're going to be able to duck. Esther, this is not a fight that you can avoid. It's here, and if you're not courageous, if you don't stand up now, you're not going to have a chance to stand up later. And you and I need to be aware of that in our public lives. I'm just going to mention this because I really want to talk to you about your private life. But in your public life and your private life, listen, now is a time to stand up and be courageous. Because if you wait too long, you might not have a chance to stand up. Again, we are living in a time when biblical Christianity, and I'm just going to say this because you know it, and I'm going to move on. We are living in a time when those who believe that we ought to live according to the Bible and believe that we don't have any other choice but to live according to the Bible, we have a large bullseye on our back. Again, there are people in our culture and perhaps they are well-meaning people, but they want behaviors widely accepted in this culture, and they will not stop until it happens. And the only ones who stand in the way of that happening are Bible-believing Christians. The culture, the woke culture knew there were two great enemies to complete acceptance of behaviors that are ostracized or condemned in Scripture. The first was psychiatry who looked at many of these behaviors and said they are disorders. But psychiatry capitulated. Psychiatry has surrendered to the woke culture. Half of the religious world has surrendered to the woke culture. The last few remaining that are Bible-believing Christians are in the minority, the great minority, and they are the last holdout to widespread acceptance to complete uh, liberality in this nation. This is not something that can be avoided anymore. I'm sorry you can't move to the Cayman Islands. There's no place to run from this situation. You better find your courage. I better find my courage. We have to find our courage. But now even in our private lives, there are some things that are going to kill you that are unavoidable if we don't have the courage to confront them. The Bible says sin is something that you and I have to confront in our lives before it kills us. If we don't have the courage to rise up and look ourselves in the mirror and say, this is wrong in my life, God says this is wrong, and whatever it costs me, I'm going to deal with it. If we don't do that, there'll be a day that comes in our life when it might be too late to confront. There are folks in our religious world who say, listen, you sin more or less every day. You sin then, you sin now, you'll sin in the future. God forgives sins in the past, the present. He forgives sins in the future. But that is not biblical Christianity. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6, 23. The Bible says in James that when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. What the Bible is saying is that if we don't have the courage to confront the issues of our heart, that the Bible says are sins, that those things will destroy us in the end. It's a place in Genesis chapter 3 where Cain has uh, issues with his brother Abel. And uh, he's got a lot of envy. There's a lot of hatred that's rising up in his heart. And God doesn't come to Cain and say, Cain, this is a dysfunction in your heart. You ought to think about finding treatment for it. He comes to Cain and he says, Cain, this thing crouches at your door 
and it desires to have you and you must master it. In other words, he says, listen, Cain, this thing that's going on in your heart, it's a wild animal. It's a crouching tiger and a hidden dragon in your life. If you don't get it, it's going to get you. And that's sin. There's a place in 2 Samuel chapter 15, which is really the backstory to the Esther story, if you want to go all the way back. Uh, it's 500 years before, but you won't have the Esther story unless you have 1 Samuel chapter 15. There's a king named Saul. And God said through Samuel, the prophet Saul, I want you to fight the Amalekites and uh, destroy them, wipe them out. They are an evil nation. They're up to no good. They have always been up to no good. I see them as irredeemable at this point. Kill them all. And Samuel goes and he, uh, Saul goes and he fights them, but he leaves the king alive, a man named Agag. And from what we can tell, he leaves others alive. He's not entirely truthful because he tells Saul, I just left the king alive. But actually, he left others alive. 20 years later, he gets into a fight against a uh, group of, uh, of nations, and Saul is killed. And a person comes to Saul who had been at the battle, or comes to David, who had been at the battle, to report Saul's death. And in 2 Samuel, uh, this person is telling about the death of Saul. And David says, well, how did he die? And uh, he says, well, uh, he was going to kill himself, but he, he didn't, I guess, have the courage to kill himself. So he looked at me and said, you come over and you run the sword through me. And he said, so I went over and I leaned over him and I ran the sword through him. And I took his crown and I took his sword and now I'm bringing it to you. And David looks at him and says, who are you? And in verse 10, he says, I am an Amalekite. Amalekite. God had told Samuel, or Samuel to tell Saul, destroy the Amalekites. Saul didn't do it. On his deathbed, the last face he saw with a sword running through his heart was an Amalekite. It got him in the end. Listen to me, there are some things that if you don't deal with in your life called sin, they will be looking at you on your deathbed. They will get you. You better deal with the addiction. You better deal with the alcohol. You better deal with the pills. If you don't get them, they'll get you. You better deal with the greed. You better deal with the lust. You better deal with the sex problem. You better deal with the anger. You better deal with the strife. You better deal with the envy. You better deal with the hatred. Because if you don't get it, the Bible says it will get you. It doesn't just get you. It gets your family. Because here, the man who is plotting against the Jews to kill them. You know what his name is? Haman, verse 3, chapter 3. Verse 1, Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agat, Agagite. Saul left Agag alive for a time. Agag had children who got away because Saul let him get away. 500 years later, why does this man hate the Jews? Because he had been bred to hate the Jews generationally. What Saul let go, not only stood over his deathbed and looked him in the face as he died, but 500 years later, the children of Saul were still having to deal with an enemy that Saul should have taken care of. And you don't have Esther if Saul does his job 500 years before. Listen to me, some of you are dealing with some things in your life because your parents didn't deal with those things. 
You're dealing with alcohol in your life because your parents didn't deal with alcohol and it got passed through and they drank in front of you and it wasn't serious and it was easy for you to get into that lifestyle and now you're here. You got some stuff going on in your life that you wouldn't have in your life if your parents had taken you to church and, and let you hear the gospel and mentored you, but they didn't. They waited a long time and because they didn't deal with the stuff in their life, you're dealing with some stuff in your life. What we don't deal with in our life Lives, our children will face in their lives. There are some things that if you don't get it, it is going to get you. You need to have courage. You need to have courage because sometimes you can't run and hide. You can't run from the things of the dis or the dysfunctions of your heart. You can't run from those things. They chase you. The unforgiveness chases you. The addiction chases you. The things you let loose in your heart, they continue to chase you. And on your deathbed, they mock you. You need to stand. You need to have courage in your public and private life, first of all, because there comes a time when you can't escape those things. Secondly, you need to have courage when you remember who is on your side. Who's on your side? It's interesting that Haman um, decides to kill Mordecai. The reason he decided to steal Mordecai is a 21st century issue. Mordecai or Haman was riding through the town one day and everybody was bowing to him. Except, according to verse 2, Mordecai, Mordecai would not bend the knee. He wouldn't bow. He said, throw me off the team. Do whatever you have to do. But I'm not taking the knee to this man. And so, Haman has a plot. He says, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill him. I'm going to kill him. But this is what happens. Haman says, I'm going to hang this guy. And he begins to build a gallows in his backyard. And that was his mistake. Because he was building the gallows at night, and he was a neighbor of the king. He kept the king up. He's working on the gallows. And in chapter 6, verse 1, it says, That night the king could not sleep. Haman's out there hammering, sawing, making a big noise in the neighborhood. The king can't sleep because of the plots of Haman. So he commands someone to bring a book of the records. And he begins reading it. And he reads in there how many years before Mordecai had reported a conspiracy against him and had actually saved his life. So Haman's planning to kill Mordecai. He keeps the king awake because the king can't sleep for all the hammer in the backyard. He begins to read the book and he says, Oh, I owe Mordecai a favor. In chapter verse 8, he brings Haman in and says, Haman, what should I do for a man who king delights to honor? Haman, of course, thinks it's him. And he says, well, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn and a horse on which the king has ridden and a royal crest placed on his head. And then when he's wearing the robe and, and he's on the horse, let it be led by one of the king's most noble princes through the town. This is what should happen for someone the king delights to honor. And the king says, well, that's a great idea. Let it be done for Mordecai and you lead the horse. Listen to me, there's a king that's awake tonight. King who understands. Esther didn't think she had an ally, but there was a king who was awake that was thinking about her situation. You and I have a king who neither slumbers nor sleeps. And in chapter 7, Esther and the king have made amends. They've rekindled the romance in their life. And they have a banquet. Haman is there. The king is there. Esther is there. And Esther decides to put the knife in. She says to her husband uh, that she has a petition. And 
In verse 2, it says, On the second day at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom it shall be done. Alda took half the kingdom. She didn't. Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me as my petition, and my people at my request, for we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. The king, the king answered and said to Queen Esther, well, who is he? Where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, the adversary, the enemy, is this wicked Haman. And Haman was terrified before the king and queen. He begs Esther to save his life, but she will not. And the Bible says that Haman is hung on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Listen to me, you ought to be courageous tonight because you don't have any other choice. You ought to find courage because you don't have any other choice. You, you ought to find courage because your enemy's not going away and sin is in your life. And if you don't deal with the, have have the courage to ask God to help you deal with the sin that's in your life, if you don't have the courage to confess it, to accept it, to fight against it, it's going to kill you. You better get it before it gets you. You ought to have the courage because you got no other choice but to be courageous in the end. You also ought to be courageous because there is a king who doesn't sleep or slumber. He sits on a throne in heaven and he is on your side. He's for you. And when Esther had the courage to say, King, help me. The king says, I love you. You have favor with me. I'm with you. Your enemy is my enemy. And I'm here to help you fight this war. You ought to do that. You have a father in heaven who loves you tonight, who can help you win the fight that you haven't maybe won yet in your life. Have you ever wondered why God did not jump, just destroy Adam and Eve when they sinned? Because God could look down in history and he knew it was going to end up like this. I mean, God looked down and he knew once Adam and Eve sinned that all of this would be unleashed. You know why God didn't destroy them? Because he finds great pleasure in redeeming people. He loves to redeem people. He loves to save people. He found pleasure in taking Adam and Eve and saving them and helping them and, and bringing them to a place where they were, would be with him in heaven. That's what thrills God. My favorite verse, uh, maybe in the Bible right now, you know, it changes, but my favorite one that I'm driving my people crazy with because I work it in every sermon. Uh, it's Amos chapter 3, 12, where God says to the children uh, of, of, of Samaria, he, he says, you're like a lamb in the mouth of a lion, and there's two legs and an ear left. That's all that's left of you. But I'm going to take you, I'm going to redeem you, I'm going to heal you, I'm going to put life back inside of you. Two legs and ear. That's not much to work with. But God says, I delight in taking people out of the lion's mouth. I delight in restoring people. God delights in helping you today. You may be sitting here and saying, how could I ever come to him? I'm so embarrassed. I've done it again and again. How, how, could, I, how could I do this? The world has, to, has eaten me up. I feel like there's no life in me. I'm the guy with two legs and an ear, and I'm embarrassed. No, God says, I love people like you. You're the kind of people that I'm after. You're the kind of people that caused me not to destroy Adam and Eve. I live for people like you. You ought to have courage tonight to confront some stuff in your life because there is a king that's awake tonight. There is nothing out of his power. He has supreme power. And if there's anything in your life, listen to me, I'm preaching to you like I might wreck on my way home. I'm preaching to you like this is the last sermon I'm going to preach. If there is anything in your life, God is here to save you. He can help you. You don't have to have anything to bring them. He can do it all. 
You can do it. All you got to do is say, I got the courage to ask. I'm going to get up the courage and I'm going to go to the king. And I don't know what's going to happen, but I believe that if I go in there, that he'll bless me. And if I can get to the king, he is able to fix my problem. Jesus Christ can do it for you today. Your marriage is not beyond his ability to fix. Your addiction is not stronger than his power. Not stronger than his power. Your past is not stronger than his power. There's people in this room who've had terrible things done to them. God can help you. He can give peace where you don't have peace. Your past is not stronger than his power. Not. The people in your life are not stronger than God. God can help you tonight. There is a God who's awake. But we got to rediscover our courage. It may be a courageous thing. Stand with me. Stand with me. It may be a courageous thing for you to walk down an aisle and ask the king to help you tonight. But I think you ought to do it. I think you ought to do it. I believe in altar calls. I think if Naaman doesn't go into the water, he doesn't get healed. It was hard for Naaman. Uh, Naaman was the great general, the Syrian general, and, and God said, listen, I don't want your money. I don't want anything you have to give to me, Naaman. If you'll go into the Jordan River seven times and dunk yourself in front of your people, if you'll humble yourself, if you've got the courage to humble yourself, I'll heal you. I don't want anything from you. Bible says he gives grace to the humble. Let me say it better. He gives grace to the courageous. But he resists the proud or the weak. Resist the people who are too weak to have the courage to be humble. That's that. There's a place in the Bible, and I'm finished here. I'm finished where there's a storm. The disciples are out on the water and there's this great storm. Jesus comes walking on the water. And I don't know what you make of that. But it says he would have passed them by, but they cried out. If you believe that where two or three are gathered together, God is in the midst and you gotta believe Jesus is here tonight. And you got to believe he's walking by. He'll walk past you tonight unless you cry out. Got to cry out. Father, I pray for those who are here that you would bless them abundantly. Father, I believe that every person here tonight is not here by accident. They might have come for a reason in their mind, but the reason behind the reason is that you drew them here and there's somebody you want to deliver tonight. There's somebody you want to free. There's somebody with an addiction and you're increasing their faith right in this moment to say, I believe that the king who doesn't slumber or sleep, I believe he can help me if I'll reach out and cry out tonight. There's a person here tonight and there are two legs and an ear. Maybe they're coming out of a relationship. Maybe they've been in a deep, dark place and those have been easy to get in during this lockdown. Give them courage tonight to come to the King. The King can help them. The King has the answer. There's no enemy alive. Even depression doesn't have power greater than the Spirit of God because greater is the power in us. There is power in this world that's greater than anxiety and depression and despair and hopelessness. Father, I believe that you're passing through this room. I believe it. I receive it by faith. I receive that. Now may courage rise, may courage rise. Father, no one here today should be laying on their deathbed someday 
and have the problem they're facing tonight still in their life. There's deliverance tonight in the name of Christ Jesus. Put power into this room, I pray. Deliver, we ask, for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Number one, number 145. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Je Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. It white as snow. Isn't it exciting to know and read all those stories in the Bible? God has a thousand ways to solve our deepest problems. He's never befuddled. He's never outwitted. All he wants to know is that his children will very sincerely and faithfully and honestly look at him and turn to him when they're dealing with problems that are much bigger than they are. And he's got a thousand ways to, to win the battle for you. And there's a great story in 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter, where the children of Ammon and the Moabites, three armies were coming against Jehoshaphat. He receives news. He's outnumbered. He's outgunned. He didn't know what to do. He called for a fast, called for a prayer meeting. He said, God, we don't know what to do. We're outnumbered, but our eyes are upon you. And you know how they won the battle? God said to Jehoshaphat, get the choir together. Don't take swords, don't take spears. Just get the choir together. And you march into those three armies and you start singing about holiness and you start singing about the praises of God and that's all they needed to defeat this big problem that they had. God's got a hundred ways to solve your problem. But he wants you to depend on him. He wants you to, to not cause the stress of the situation to cause you to make the wrong moves. You need to stay under the Spirit's control when you're going through a, a dark place. And they started singing, the choir. Nobody had swords. And the Bible said the Lord set ambushments and the three armies, two armies killed one another and then the third army started killing themselves. And everybody was wiped out. That was the big problem. And all it took was a choir. Whatever problem you've got tonight, you've got to know God knows how to solve your problem. But he wants you to lean on him. He wants you to submit to him and say, God, this problem is destroying me. And I'm afraid I might do the wrong thing. And most of the time, 
Believers do the wrong thing. In a panic to escape, they do the wrong thing. The right thing is to fall on your knees and say, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Somebody needs to lift their eyes to God tonight like these did. We're going to sing one more voice. Thank God. Wonder, what a, I love these stories, how God solves our big problems. As we sing, if anyone else feels they need to come, the altars are open. God bless you as we sing. Lord, now indeed I find Trust the Lord Thy power and thine alone Trust the Lord tonight And change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left Give it to a the crimson Lord. stain. Just put it in his lap. He He's got a thousand ways to solve it your problem. Just the just the chorus, Brother Sherman. Anyone else? Jesus God bless you. It's been a great service. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Thank God.